So today I want to share with you a conversation that has made me a better person, and I hope it has the same effect on you. It's with Teju Ravi Lochan, whom I discovered going down some sort of web rabbit hole, and I found myself on medium.com reading an article that he had written about Abraham Maslow, who is the the founder of the idea of the, you know, the hierarchy of needs, the idea of self-actualization, that there's a, a bunch of stepwise processes and, and requirements that human have, humans have in order to reach their true potential. And, it, and according to the article, he was heavily influenced, Maslow was, by the Blackfoot Nation, a Native American tribe um, with whom he lived for a while. And he took their ideas, but in some sense, either because he didn't understand them or because he felt like they weren't pedigreed enough for academia. He left a lot out and we have misinterpreted, whether he misinterpreted or we did, the idea of this hierarchy of needs kind of flips the Blackfoot notion on its head, which is that humans arrive self-actualized and it's the goal, the job of the community of their uh, of the nest in which they grow up, the, the, the adults of concern to make sure that that um, self-actualization is supported, realized, and brought to bear for the good of the community. And that's kind of the exact opposite, where we need our um, you know, food and shelter and all the things the community give us so that we can become the most individuated, the most um, unique individuals. And you can see there's a lot of problems that we have in our Western world by lionizing the individual over the community. And so I wanted to find out more about Teju, about what he did. So I did a Google search and uh, it's pretty easy to parse the name Teju Ravi Lochan. There's not, it's not like John Smith. There was clearly just one of him. And, and I was surprised at first to discover that he was a Forbes magazine 30 under 30, which means like one of the top 30 business leaders in the world under the age of 30. And I thought, well, a guy who writes about like communitarianism, how is that person in business? And the more I um, looked, the more I discovered that Teju is really promoting a view of business in a very ecological sense, like something, a, a um, interactions, interdependencies that lift all of us and honor all of us and include all of us rather than this top down 1%, the rich get richer and everybody else struggles more and more. And this includes economic justice, social justice, racial justice, um, environmental justice, and it's really a beautiful world. So Teju is kind, generous, articulate, funny. You should check out his TED Talk in which he um, starts out by telling a wonderful story about being incredibly nervous and asking a girl out on a date. And he was really generous to give his time, um, actually almost an hour and a half. We had, this is, this um, session is gonna be in three parts. First, we ran out of time. Second, my computer froze. And then we got the third one in the can. So I hope you find this as valuable and important and interesting as I do. Leave me a comment if you're watching on YouTube or if you're listening at plantyourself.com, you can leave a comment on the blog and I'll uh, meet you again after the conversation. So without further ado, Teju Ravi Lochan, welcome to the Plant Yourself podcast. Thank you so much, Howie. Uh, so um, let's let's begin by finding out a little bit about about you and uh, what what you're up to now and what's led there. Sure. Um, so um, I uh, am someone who really believes in belonging, and I think that one of the one of the tragedies of the time that we're living in is, is separation, is the idea that what happens to you doesn't in some way happen to me. And, you know, in my own journey, I've been trying to understand how to grow my capacity to hold more, hold other people's experiences, their suffering, their joy, and, and really be able to connect to that. And from that connection, you know, be a presence, be a support, um, you know, be there, be with. And so I think um, that's something that I've really just cared about um, for, a, for a long time. I, I grew up in Colorado. My parents are immigrants from India and uh, they, they arrived in the United States with $200 in their pockets. Both of them were trained as doctors, but it was very difficult for them to find employment opportunities. 
And they were really supported by my uncle who gave them a place to stay by a stranger named Bob Selker who made a phone call that landed my dad his first job in Colorado. Um, and, and there was just a lot of community who popped up and supported them. And so they have this sort of American dream story of immigrants arriving here and building a life. And yet what's, what's often underemphasized is how transformative the support of other people was on that journey, the community was on that journey. Um, and so I find that really inspiring to just think about the people who supported them. And, you know, growing up as an Indian American in predominantly white communities, I noticed a lot of differences between the way my family did things and the way the outside community did things. Um, and so that really marked and shaped me over the course of my life um, in, in knowing that there's not just one way to do something, that there are many ways, there, there are different values that communities can have about how to do something. Uh, and so I think that's been something that's really, really shaped me as has returning to India and, and seeing the inequality there and finding myself aghast that we allow inequality, not just in India, but then becoming more aware of it here in the United States where I'm now doing work um, has really has really made me wonder how can we allow people to be homeless, to be poor, to not have food to eat, you know? And so I think those are questions that I've been preoccupied with and I'm happy to tell you more about the work I'm doing, but I'll pause there and, and see if there, that brings up anything for you. Yeah, it does. I mean, it's, it's, it's lovely that, cause that part often gets truncated from rags to riches stories from success stories that tend to be in our narrative and in, in the in the cultural narrative of the United States tends to be individual achievement, right? Like, you know, I arrived here with $200 in my pocket. Nobody gave me a handout. I worked my way. And it's impossible to imagine those stories occurring without the help of a community, without serendipity, without um, people feeling like someone else's journey was important enough to help and you know like we can tell that story so many different ways um and i'm curious what got you to really look through life through this lens of sort of support and belonging because you know you're you're in the forbes like 30 under 30 like you're you're familiar with sort of the capitalist ethos you've you created a, a you know an institute designed to solve the impossible like when i think of those values i think of like individual heroes of capitalism and you have all those values and you've taken uh, you you know you've made it a collective effort rather than individual i'm wondering if you can like think about moments in your life that kind of pushed you there yeah it's a great question uh, it's true. I mean, you know, growing up, I I struggled with belonging. It was it was sort of a wound that I had because you know when I was young, I would hear things like I would go out to play soccer at recess, and I would hear things like "You're too dark to play with us." You know, like other kids wouldn't let me play with them. Um, I would be asked at, at the, in the cafeteria, "Do you even know who the president is?" You know, as though because I'm brown, I wouldn't know that. Um, and you know, on September 11th, people asked me if I was a terrorist. Classmates I'd known for years, you know, and, and so it's just, it was, it was almost, in all these cases, it was sort of, uh, it was, it was, it was both difficult and also somewhat like laughable, these questions, you know, as though these, these are, any of these are connected. Uh, and yet, because I wanted to belong and want to, you know, my strategy was, okay, well, I'm going to be the best soccer player. I'm going to know all the presidents in order, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to achieve and succeed. And then my belonging will be undeniable. And, you know, even though I learned later that that's not always the path to belonging, I have a lot of compassion for that child in me who created that strategy to, in order to achieve belonging in a way, it's kind of smart. And it's a strategy that a lot of us use, I think, to try to belong and try to connect. But achievement and success became really important to me. Being right became really important to me. Being the best became really important to me. And, uh, and so, you know, I, I was doing that for a while and I had all these moments in life where I wasn't able to be the best and it was really painful for me. But then, because what I wanted was belonging, what I wanted was the recognition or the, the you know, and, and 
an, an example was in, in 11th grade when I started calculus. Calculus was really hard for me. I struggled with calculus. But some of my other classmates were doing well in calculus. And it was this moment where because I was not doing well, I had to ask for help. I had to kind of humble myself and know I can learn from other people. And actually that was maybe when I started to make the deepest friendships in high school is when I really realized like I need other people. Like I need the support, the wisdom, the intelligence of others who see things differently from me. And I can't just be this island being the best, achieving whatever. Um, and I found that really interesting. Uh, but, you know, of course, our paths are not linear. And, you know, the story of achievement was still in me, even though I had this experience. And I cared about inequality. I went to India, I visited villages and slums and, um, and found, you know, people who were addressing these issues themselves. And, and, I, and that helped me co-found the Unreasonable Institute, which, um, which supports entrepreneurs addressing issues related to inequality and climate change. You know, we supported hundreds of entrepreneurs who've, who've in some way benefited over 75 million people who have raised, you know, over, over $500 million. And yet when I was doing that work, which I did for nine years, I, I had some emptiness in me. I had some feelings of um, dissatisfaction and there are many reasons for that. Uh, one, one reason is that I was, just like you said, I was, again, really interested in success. So for me, the number was never big enough. The number of lives that our organizations had touched, the, the, the amount of impact, it was always almost greedy for more impact, you know, just replacing the bottom line of like dollars with the bottom line of impact. And it was perpetually dissatisfying because I never felt like we were doing enough. And I, I felt that way even more poignantly when I started talking to some of our entrepreneurs about the challenges they were facing. We met, I met one entrepreneur named Naveen Kumar who came from the slums of Hyderabad. He grew up himself very poor. And in India, sometimes poor families will not send all of their kids to school because they have to pay for it out of pocket they will send one of their children to school, whoever they think has the best chance. So he was the one chosen by his family to go to school. And he is able to see the difference in his life compared to the life of his siblings. So he wanted to create affordable models of education that would be accessible to other people. And he created this model that costed $8 a month for kids in the slums, uh, for their families. And, uh, and it, was, it was effective, it had awards for its curriculum, and it was proving profitable. So we had this nucleus of impact and of business. Like it was, it was, it could, that, that nucleus meant this maybe could scale. And he was already 20 at 25 schools. So when he came to Unreasonable Institute, I asked him, how can you reach, you know, 200 schools, 2000 schools that there's a voracious demand and need in India for education. And he said, you know what our biggest obstacle is outside of funding and, you know, a couple other pieces is attendance. And the reason attendance was an obstacle, he explained, is that the kids that they were supporting kept getting sick from drinking contaminated water or from malaria. Um, the parents needed the kids to stay home, even at young ages, like four and five, to do work around the house that would support the family earning income. The parents wouldn't be as concerned with sending the girls because India is a place where gender equality is not a realized dream. And so, you know, and there were all these other issues that, that were part of the question of how do, you, how do you support a population in receiving education, in, in achieving education? And that was a moment where I really paused and it was like, wow, all these entrepreneurs that we're working with have to really become experts in one thing. And yet as humans, we need so many things. We all need school, we need food, we need housing, we need clean water, we need love, we need community, we need you know, financial security, all of these things are needed. And if we are providing one, one of these pieces in a context where those other pieces are not provided, then actually that becomes an obstacle to even receiving that one piece, if that makes sense. And it's not true only in India. In Denver, where I grew up, the number one reason that kids miss school is toothaches. And the reason 
that toothaches are so common is that many of the kids come from low income communities and live in food deserts, which food deserts are areas where there's no grocery store within a mile. And, and so a lot of these families may not have cars, public transportation is difficult, getting in the grocery store is hard. So what they can afford and what's around are gas stations, convenience stores, where they buy food that's loaded with sugar, that's loaded with preservatives, that sugar erodes the teeth of these kids and they get tooth infections. Um, and because often they don't have health insurance or dental insurance, they don't see the dentist and they and their teeth, and so it caused them to miss school. That's in Denver, Colorado, where I grew up. That's not within the purview of the Department of Education. You know what I mean? And so this, this siloed approach to solving individual human needs as opposed to really ensuring the holistic well-being was one of the things I noticed maybe something about this work that I'm doing is not enough. Um, and so I found that really, really interesting. Um, and, and the second thing was, you know, we were not doing much about power. And, and I was noticing that it's the same people, generation after generation, who are falling into poverty, who are wrestling with housing, who are wrestling with education and health. And, and you know, indeed, there's a Harvard economist, Raj Chetty, who's, who's, who's created something called the Opportunity Atlas, where he's mapped the zip codes of America. Um, and he's looked at IRS data and U.S. Census Bureau data. And he can basically predict with an extremely high, like upward of 80% accuracy, the amount of income that someone will earn based on where they grew up, like which zip code in which they grew up, which is an America, meaning we have a calcified set of structures that actually are not allowing for social mobility. Um, America is one of the lowest rated in social mobility among developed nations in the world. And so, um, and, and so I was thinking, what are we doing as an organization about these calcified structures? And I, it, it, you know, I think I started to learn that, that poverty may not be the result of, of scarcity, not having access, not having enough. Poverty may actually be the result of inequality, of the belief that some people are better than others, and therefore some people are not included in the distribution of resources or in the way that we create our neighborhoods or our schools or our systems. And so there's actually at the core this, this idea of non-belonging that is alive in the inequities that we're seeing in the world. And, and of course, this left me with the question, I know I was struggling with belonging my whole life, but why is it that people in power who have the privilege sometimes of building systems, creating structures, why do they build and create these systems and structures to amplify their own power? You know, like I learned, for example, that our education system in the United States was built by the Council of Ten, convened by Horace Mann, um, who all wanted who wanted America to transition to this industrial economy from an agrarian one, who were running factories, and they built an education model to create great factory workers because they wanted to grow their opportunity to earn. And why would they, why would that be their goal? Why do powerful people often in these positions of creating systems, create systems that make themselves more powerful? And so what, in my study of this, I think what I've been learning is, you know, James Baldwin, who's considered the voice of the civil rights movement, a brilliant writer, contemporary of Martin Luther King, and, um, you know, wrote a letter to his nephew about what it's like to be black in America. And in this letter, he says, you know, it's gonna be terrible being black. It's gonna be difficult. You're gonna be hated for no reason. You're not gonna be given opportunities, but be compassionate, he says, toward our white brothers and sisters. They are trapped in a history that they don't understand. And until they can heal that, until they can actually learn that they are loved, we will have racism. But the moment they learn that, there will be no more racism because it won't be necessary. It won't be needed. This is what he advises his nephew. And in my study, what I think I've been learning is that the seeking of power and, and the reason that it's never enough, the same feeling I was having in my own work, our impact is never enough. I think it comes from a wound that I can't trust other people to take care of me. I can't trust my environment to take care of me. 
And so the only way I'm going to be okay is if I make other people take care of, I make the world around me take care of me. And that means seeking the power that allows you to control your environment, control people around you. And that is an endless pursuit. You never have enough control to ensure that you're okay. And so it was in that inquiry, basically, that I decided to leave my previous work um, at Unreasonable Institute, spend some time healing my own wounds around belonging through you know, going on a rafting trip and right for a month and trying to connect with nature or going on meditation retreats and trying to be still and understand my own hurt and, um, you know, getting to play. I tried an improv class, all these things. I took two and a half years off and it's now to me the work I'm doing now. It's really focused on would it be possible to create for people the experience of unconditional belonging? Is that healing? Does that offer us a way forward? And so, that's a really lengthy answer to your question, Allie, that that's a little bit about how, you know, for me, I have really come to value the creation of, of opportunities to belong and for people to be loved in order to heal some of the wounds that are resulting in us creating unequal systems. Mm, there's, there's, so, there's so much there what you said, and there are, several, there are several points where I'm like, you know, holding back tears so I can, you know, not leak during this podcast. It was so so beautiful. I mean, right? And there's so much so much I want to reflect on. I'll try to keep it brief because I want to you know center this on you. But right now in the in the southeast here, we have a gas crisis because of the the pipeline that got hacked. And apparently the crisis wasn't because the pipeline got hacked. The pipe the crisis was because everybody went to fill up and hoard. And there's photos I'm seeing on social media of people with rubber made uh tubs full of gasoline in the back of their car and plastic bags and people you know filling up the back of their truck with like 55 gallons and red containers and it's this you know you can see this fear and i'm, I'm also on you know nextdoor.com which is sort of like the, the local facebook thing and which is, you know, which was built to foster community. And instead it's fostering arguments and virtue signaling about who's, who's deserving of gasoline and who is a jerk and who's selfish and who's greedy and what's wrong with us. And when I hear you, you kind of lead me on this journey of discovery. It's like, yeah, this, this fear that I don't belong, I'm separate. And therefore, I'm constantly at risk. So, you know, what comes to me is um, sort of the, you know, the, the chakra system of, uh, of the different energy centers of the body. And the, the, the first chakra, the root chakra, is your connection to Mother Earth. And if you don't have that, if you don't, if you'd never have felt mothered by something larger than, you know, your immediate family, it's like, maybe, you know, that. We look at really wealthy, the same way James Baldwin looked at white people who were the privileged ones and saw only their pain and their wound and was able to speak with compassion to look at the richest people in the world and say like, boy, how, how much do you, must you be suffering in mm. order to need to compensate? Like when you, mm. you're comp overcompensating to achieve success so you, you know, get picked for soccer and have friends. But, mm. That's a whole nother level to be, you know, to be a billionaire. Like, wow, I'm like, my heart bleeds for them, literally, like, like really. Mm. That's right. And, you know, what I think is helpful for me is to see myself in their journey. And it's, it, you know, I don't truly know what Donald Trump's story is. I guess there's now biographical information about that. And, I don't, you know, I don't know. Uh, what Benjamin Netanyahu's story is with everything happening right now in Israel and Palestine. I don't know what, um, you know, what the stories are of a lot of people who are in power, Jeff Bezos or, you know, who have great wealth. Um, and, and I don't think that they are, I don't think, I'm not interested anymore in this categorization, good people and bad people. You know, I, I, I don't think that that's actually a helpful way of telling a story or relating to other human beings, you know, but mm -hmm. I, I, I do think about how I can see myself in these people. Like, have I not felt excluded? Have I not desired to, just as you say, succeed and win and achieve and be perfect and be bulletproof and be impenetrable in order to, in some way, attempt to achieve belonging and acceptance and love? 
Um, and, and so, you know, I, I, I think Paulo Freire says it really well. And he says, really oppression has two victims, the oppressed and the oppressor. Both are dehumanized by oppression. And our work is to restore everyone's humanity. You know, if we just rise up, and he says this, if the oppressed, it's, he says it's very important for the oppressed to rise up and challenge the status quo. Um, but he says, what do we do if we only change poles? If suddenly the oppressed gain power and now are the oppressors in a system and they turn around and they, they oppress others. That changing poles we see throughout history, but he says what really is needed is the oppressed must commit to changing their reality and restore their own humanity. And they must also restore the humanity of the oppressed source and liberate them from the need to oppress. Um, and, and, and that, you know, that, 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 that means basically saying like, we want to create a new world and you have, you have caused hurt. You know, you have, you have really caused suffering. And, and accountability is important. Recognizing that hurt is important. Healing from that is important. And you also get to belong in this new world that we're building. You also get to be part of it. And I think that is a really, it's difficult to say all these things, right? It's, you know, it's, it's especially in a, in a moment in our, in our history where, you know, you have to, you have to acknowledge the invisible systems of oppression. And we're doing a better job, I think right now as society, as a culture of naming those, noticing those, calling those out and asking men to, to consider their behavior around women, you know, in the Me Too movement and, and the ways that they've been objectifying and mistreating and dehumanizing women for so long. And that's not only reflected in sexual harassment, but it's also reflected in workplace policies around maternity leave and around compensation, around all of these different things, the way that our system treats people who are black and who are people of color and incarcerates them at, at unbelievable rates and treats them with un, un, completely unjustified violence, um, you know, that, that they actually wind up not having the rights that are constitution enshrined. You know, 97% of the people who find themselves in jail today never had a trial they're so worried the system isn't there for them that they had to take a plea deal and admit that they were guilty, whether or not they were guilty to serve a sentence that they saw as at least somewhat tolerable, you know, compared to the maximum sentence that they could have gotten. You know, we have, we have all these systems that are unjust and, and, and calling those out and recognizing those is extremely and critically important. Um, and I also believe that just as Paulo Freire is saying, just as I think Martin Luther King and Gandhi and, and other such leaders embodied, if we don't see the humanity of the oppressors as well, if we don't recognize that they are humans and not only enemies, not only people to take down and remove from power, you know, we may continue to repeat this pattern that we have been on and oppression may continue. Um, and so that's, that's one of the reasons that I'm interested in belonging and inclusiveness that includes everyone uh, as hard and as naive as that might be or sound that's, that's one of the reasons I've been really drawn to that inquiry. Yeah, so I'm feeling in myself a desire to go into all the obstacles. So I just wanna, I wanna, I just wanna say them just so I get them out of my head. Yeah. Like one, one is, I think you know, the climate crisis is increasing the, the very powerful's feeling of fear that they've got mm -hmm. to build their bunkers and their, you know, stations on Mars or whatever, and kind of separating them more, you know, the sort of Elysium complex. There's um, a very strong, in my community, a sort of progressive is a very strong um, cancel culture. Like just to call mm -hmm. it like when somebody has sinned, mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. almost like nobody wants to let them back in. Like they're mm -hmm. like, you know, no, you know, okay, now you want to come and you want to give us your, your apology and you want to do your bestseller tour and you're still profiting off of the shit you did. Um, but I think I don't want to go there. I think I want to ask you, mm -hmm. um, like what, what you have created in the way of, of solutions. Now I'm coming mm -hmm. back to, you know, 
I'm, one question is like, when you were a kid, how did you talk to your parents about mm -hmm. your your strategies? Because they, you know, they they came, I presume, from a very communal culture. Mm. Like, how did you know? How do communities solve problems that individuals can't? It's a really excellent question. I, they did come from communal cultures, and they lived in multi multi-family homes, um, grew up with cousins and uncles and aunts in the home. Um, and they were, it was imperfect. I mean, there was hierarchy in those systems and, and, uh, and they weren't sort of the, you know, the, the children of the matriarch or the patriarch of the family. And so they experienced some challenges because of that. So it's not, it's not to say community is perfect and individuals are flawed. It, you know, I think it's much more nuanced than that. There's, there's gifts of both orientations. Um, but of course, to 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 have a story like we do in our country that it's up to you on your own to solve for your own needs, you know, I think that leads to the kind of inequality that we are seeing in America, where one in four households are currently food insecure, you know, where four in 10 Americans can't afford a $400 emergency, which was even before the pandemic, it's probably higher now, um, where 0.1% the 0.1% wealthiest Americans own as much wealth as 90% of other Americans. And so I think there is staggering inequality in our culture. And I think some of it is related to our individual orientation and the story and the way that we've continued that story and defended that story and protected that story time and again, um, which I think is, is the result of those in power wanting to protect and defend that story. We can talk about that, but your question is about how I talk to my parents and, you know, um, I didn't talk to them actually when I was a kid because about this, because I was very afraid that by trying to fit in with my peers in school, that I was somehow not going to fit in with them. I had to choose between being Indian and being American. Um, you know, I couldn't be both. I, I, if I was Indian, you know, then I wasn't going to fit in. For example, in my culture, we have a sacred thread ceremony in Hindu, uh, in, you know, uh, Ram culture, which is also part of a problematic caste system. But, you know, that was a rite of passage for us. And I received this sacred thread. And I remember wearing it in high school and uh, underneath my shirt. And maybe we went swimming and I took off my shirt and I had this thread around me. And my, my friend was like, what is that? And, and it, I told him a little bit. And he's like, that's weird, you know. And so there are all these ways in which by embracing my Indian culture, I was kind of feeling like I was costing myself belonging in quote unquote American culture, um, white culture. Um, and, and so I, I was always afraid of talking to my parents about, you know, some of these things because I didn't want to let them down. I didn't want to disappoint them. I didn't want them to feel like I was abandoning them. Um, and I just kind of quietly internalized it and, and handled it on my own, which was difficult. It was, it was led to some pain. It led to real feelings of isolation and hurt. Um, and to be honest, I don't think it was something I really fully became aware of until I took this two and a half year period between my work at uh, Uncharted, formerly Unreasonable Institute, and the work I'm doing now with Gather4. I think it was only in that period of stillness where I did a lot of meditation, where I did a lot of, you know, traveling and by myself as well, where I was finally able to kind of appreciate this hurt and what was going on for me and start to integrate that. And so it, it is true that, you know, what I experienced in India and what I learned from my parents is a lot of community orientation, hospitality, for example, you know, my parents would go to the grocery store and they would find a kid who was maybe from India, but, um, going to college here and hadn't had a home cooked meal in a while. They would just invite him over for dinner that night and, and cook him a meal and he would become a friend and they would try to support him and advise him and help him out however they could, for instance, or, um, you know, when, when I went to India and did that traveling to visit villages and slums just as a college student without any, without any reason to people, People offered us tea and snacks. They gave us motorcycle rides to villages and they translated for us. And, you know, they just did so much to support our learning and our connection with, with other people for, for no, there's no benefit to them. They just gave in that way. And so I found immense generosity, hospitality, inclusivity, you know, there. And I also was shocked by sometimes like the caste discrimination and everything else. And so 
you know, there is a lot of, there's a lot of nuance in these conversations and imperfection and humanity. Um, but that was, that was my exploration of it with my parents and a little bit with Indian culture. So, so something coming up very personally for me. So I've been, my uh, career trajectory, I've been doing a lot of health work, health coaching. Um, and I used to do a lot of business coaching and I got away from that because it just felt yucky. And for some, for several reasons, I've sort of been moving back. I've just been asked by people, working with people that I really like. And I feel like there's this like mental break, like, well, well, I would never work with a bank, you know, like I would never work with Citibank or I would never work with Amazon because of that. Right. And so I can feel the opposite of what you're talking about, like, uh, like rejecting the humanity of the industry and even the, you know, the people in it. And mm -hmm. And at the one hand, there's this voice in my head saying, yeah, but you can make so much more money and you can be, you know, much mm -hmm. more financially free. And then I don't mm -hmm. trust that voice. And I mm -hmm. don't, you know, like, you know, part, part of what you do, uh, I think, you know, it's a nonprofit, you have funders, right? You, you get the people with money mm -hmm. to help you. I'm, I'm just thinking of, sorry, I'm, I'm rambling a little bit, but mm -hmm. uh, no. there's a, uh, a Jewish story from Eastern Europe about a, um, a rabbi who wakes up in the morning with a revelation and he's like I, I figured out how to solve poverty and mm -hmm. he you know leaves his community and goes off into the world and and like he tells people his ideas like the rich people should give half of their money to the poor and mm -hmm. he goes off for 10 comes back after 10 years and his, his villagers are like well how'd it go he said I'm halfway there the poor are willing to accept <laughs> So, so how, how, do, how do you see working with, with people who it's easy to demonize, to vilify? There mm. is a lot of sin, accountability, crime, whatever, mm. injustice, and yet mm. they have to be part of the solution. Help me, help me think through that. Yeah, it's a great question. My friend Eitan always asks sometimes when I wonder myself, like, oh, I got to do this. He always says, you know, one question to start with might be in what way am I already doing what I wish to be doing or need to be doing? And so as a starting point, one of my questions would be, okay, in what way are we already caring for the holistic well-being of others, you know, who may not have power, who may not have the privilege that we have? In what way are we doing that? And one thing I think about sometimes is there's a maybe there's a lens to see the world through, which is has problems to be solved, you know. Like the pro poverty is a problem to be solved. There's another lens to look at the world through, I think, which is something like the lens of relationship, which is this person is someone who's a relation of mine. And so, so for instance, like I think about parents and their children and a family is complicated and it's not as simple as going to make it. But a lot of times, you know, when a child is born to parents there, they really are devoted to caring for the holistic well-being of that child. And they may do that imperfectly. They bring their own wounding. They bring their, their limitations, okay? Um, but they change the diaper. They feed this baby. They, they make sure the baby can walk and talk and, and they play with the baby and, and they want the baby to feel safe and happy and have toys and imagine. And they want all of these things. They want the holistic well-being of their child. And they might, you know, as the, as the baby grows up and becomes a toddler and a kid, like, you know, take the baby to school, cry on, it, on the baby's first day or the child's first day, you know, sign the kid up for sports or, or activities, music, art, um, hang up paintings that most of us would consider, you know, not that good on the fridge, you know, <laughs> um, and really appreciate it. And, you know, like this, there's something... And it's, it's stereotypical, like there's wounding and harm and, and, and pain in families. And, and at least one story that we have about families, it looks like this. There is this very deep love between parents and children. And why does that happen? Why is it, it you know, we could say it's biological. We could say, you know, it's an instinct. Um, and, and yet, you know, there's something about that proximity. There's something about this being needing you and being dependent on you. There's like a connection there, you know, and also you, we need our, you know, uh, there's, there's, we feel powerful. We feel, you know, in some way given purpose when another being is really needing us. So there's, there's, 
and, and then of course they contribute to us. They teach us things, they bring us into the present, they make our lives richer and fill it with happiness and, and also challenge and suffering and all the other things. But so there's something about that relationship. Like when, you know, people take care a lot of the time of their children. Um, and so part of my question is, you know, would we let our children go through poverty, go through homelessness, uh, be cold at night, sleep on the street, not have enough food to eat? Would we let that happen? And, and maybe, you know, maybe at some point we might say they've got to figure it out on their own, they, you know, tough love, like that kind of thing. But, but a lot of times, you know, we, we come together to support, to support them, especially if we see them efforting and trying and knowing that, you know, it's, it's not exactly their fault they're going through these circumstances. Um, and so I think your question, how, how do we make the rich and the powerful and the privileged really engage? I think it happens through, to me, one way it can happen is through relationship. And, you know, a story about, to that effect is, um, you might have encountered it, but it's the story of Derek Black, who's the son of the leader of the white nationalist movement. Um, and, uh, and the, the godson of uh, uh, David Duke, who, you know, both, who held, who was one of the leaders of the KKK. And, and, uh, and you know, so, so Derek Black growing up was really indoctrinated with this idea of white supremacy and, and, and ran and managed a blog called Stormfront, which basically gathered and reported evidence for the superiority of white people, IQ tests, brain size, you know, all these different ways of sharing, oh, white people are better. Um, and when he became 18 and, and wanted to go to college, he really wanted to go to uh, the new, I think it's called the New College uh, in Florida, a liberal arts school. His parents were a little hesitant, but he wanted to go, so they sent him there. And so he went there and he's, he's studying history and, and, and all this stuff. And then um, his fellow classmates find out that he has this blog. Someone stumbles upon his blog and, and posts it on the student online forum. And so it becomes viral across the, the campus and everyone sees it and then immediately shuns and cancels basically Derek Black. People walk by and flip him off. People send him death threats. People spit at him. Like they just, you know, a, a, a white supremacist, the most intolerable, you know, intolerant kind of person in our society, like we're going to be intolerant kind of thing, you know, which makes sense. Should we tolerate white supremacy? Probably not. Um, it's kind right. of a, a sensible response in a way. Right. So yeah. It's always okay to punch a Nazi, right? Right. Like that sort of and thing. so, and so Matt, there's this other student, Matthew Stevenson, who is, who is, who's Jewish and, 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 and very, um, devout in his practice of Judaism. He wears a yarmulke, he holds a Shabbat dinner, a Sabbath dinner on Friday nights that he invites uh, people of color to, people who, who identify as LGBTQ, um, you know, it's very inclusive space and he has a Shabbat dinner. And, uh, and he thinks, you know, maybe the reason that he believes Jews are inferior, black people are inferior, gay people are inferior is that he's never really met them. He's never really had any conversations. So he, he talked to his community and, and not everyone consented, those who didn't stayed home, but those who consented came to Shabbat and they invited Derek Black to come to their Shabbat. And Derek Black was the community pariah and definitely wanting friends, definitely wanting the college experience. So he accepted the invitation, showed up with a bottle of wine. They didn't talk about race. They ate, they played games, they had a normal evening and became really deep friends over the course of two years. Um, and, and, and over the, that time, slowly, the conversations about race and white supremacy and, and you know, started to come up with this community. And in conversation and in dialogue and in seeing these people, really seeing them, Derek Black realized that everything that he had believed about white supremacy was in fact wrong. And, and he became scared to do it but he eventually decided to renounce his white supremacy. And he published a post on his blog, basically correcting himself, saying, I've been wrong about all these things. Um, and his family virtually disowned him. They stopped talking to him. And I don't know if that's still true now, 
And then he became an advocate, an outspoken advocate for racial equality and justice in our country. And that's, that's his story. And he was transformed by friendship. And, and so I think there's something about, you know, being in relationship with when we, when we choose to marry someone, and again, I don't, I, I'm making a generalization, it's an imperfect one. You don't know what is gonna unfold. You don't have answers to every question that life is gonna throw at you. How are we gonna make it? How are we gonna survive? You know, but we have a really romantic stories like, like uh, the Fiddler on the Roof in which like the poor tailor and, and, and you know, Rev Tevia's daughter get married and they don't have enough money but they have each other, they're happy. Like, that's our beautiful story. Like, oh, love's so powerful, you know, like that these people enter into an unknown about financial security and yet they want to be together. And I think that's actually often really the power of relationship is we don't know what's ahead, but we're going to go together. We're going to do it together. Mm -hmm. And so people ask like, what can I do about homelessness? What can I do? You know, part of my question is, well, like, Maybe what needs to happen is, are we in relationship with people who in this moment happen to be homeless? Are we in relationship with people who are living in poverty and living these, these injustices and inequalities? Do we know their stories? Do we know what they're going through? Do we see their well-being as tied to ours in some way? Do we see that what's happening to them is in some way happening to us? You know, what, what, what Derek Black finally got to witness is discrimination against Matthew Stevenson for being Jewish or against some of the other people in that community for identifying as queer or identifying as black or as people of color, it hurt him. They were his friends who he started to care about. And there was some way in which this was actually now affecting him. And so how do we make our lot connected? How do we put ourselves in the same boat? How do, you know, and, and in our country, White people and black people don't live in the same neighborhoods a lot of the time, you know? Um, and, and they don't eat lunch together in school cafeterias. Um, and, and so I think there is something about there, you know, and I, I think Tani Hussey Coates says, like, if we're going to see racial equity in our country, it means having neighborhoods where people are living together because then your kids go to the same school, then they become friends. Sometimes they fall in love. Sometimes they get married. Sometimes they create families together, you know, and, 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 and that intertwining is really needed for our being able to serve and support each other. And what's tough about money is you don't need other people when you have money. Hmm. You don't, you, you, you can pay for your needs to be met. You don't need to ask anybody for favors. You don't need other people to take care of you because you have money. And in fact, of course, a whole community is taking care of you, but you don't feel that because you're paying them. You know, like there's this layer of money between you and the community taking care of you. So I think one of the questions that I have is how do we, how do we make it so we truly need each other? How do we make it so we, our fates are intertwined, are tied together? And I think often that happens through friendship. Um, and, and so, and, and we can talk more about that, but that, let me, I'll just pause there. So, yeah, so um, you mentioned, you know, not having enough at the beginning, and I feel like I don't have enough of this conversation now. I wonder if we could pause and pick it up. I would love to, there's, I would love to have another 15 minutes, which we, we do, I don't have now. Sure, anytime. Yeah, I'd be happy to do that, Howie. No problem. I'm sorry I got here late, uh, but yeah, we can definitely do that. Oh, well, I think I would have wanted more, even if you'd started on time. It, uh, <laughs> but I, still, I still want to relate this to the Maslow post and oh yes, a lot. So if if, if that's okay with you, I'll I'll email. We'll find a, a time to pick. Great. Up yeah, we can do it. And even if you want to, do, I don't know if you're free later today or tomorrow, but I have some time, so we can we can figure it out. Yeah. Okay. I'll email you. I've got uh, I've got some some slots that I yeah I would love to continue while it's still fresh in my mind. Let's do it. Let's do it. Oh man, thank you so much. This is this has really touched my heart, and I'll we'll talk more about why in the, in the part two. All right, Teju, uh, part two. Uh, so we we were talking about um, the need to to liberate people from the need to oppress, mm -hmm. right? Um, and yeah, I mean we've had you know this this will look seamless to people watching later, but I've had several hours to really think about. Like the impact that I want to have on the 
like on organizations that I might otherwise be like, well, I'm, you know, so I was thinking about um, Matthew Stevenson, right? The, the Jewish kid at, uh, in Florida who like he must have taken a huge risk yeah. to be seen in the presence of someone who's, you know, who was so ostracized. Mm -hmm. And like, you know, like I have that same thing. I don't know if it's like, you know, virtue signaling or just safety. Mm -hmm. Like there's things I just don't feel comfortable. Like, you know, if I talk to you, then that means I'm somehow um, endorsing you or what you do. Mm -hmm. um, and I imagine, mm -hmm. you know, the work you do trying to bring balance, you have to talk to everybody. Mm -hmm. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. I think that fear is very real. And I think, you know, I think is what I'm saying that, you know, every person who's a, 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 a black people should all go talk to police, for example, uh, you know, Palestinians should go talk to Israelis. That is extremely risky. It is extremely risky. There's danger involved and we would be naive not to acknowledge the real dangers, both like the material and physical harm that could befall people in taking on those kinds of activities and also the psychological harm and also the ostracization uh, uh, that they might experience from their own communities, just like you're describing. So I think that risk is really real. It's really real. Um, you know, I, I think that there's, there's something that's really precious to us all uh, as, as humans that maybe is even, even more precious than our safety sometimes. Like, like people go to war for, for freedom. You know, people go to war so as to not be oppressed um, and they fight and, and I'm not proposing war. I, I, you know, I'm only saying that what is, what is the mechanism through which we collectively restore the humanity of ourselves and of those who oppress. And that, that having the safety to take that, that on, you know, that might be important. Matthew Stevenson brought Derek Black into his community you know, that, that there were people around that there was a way in which it was a great risk. And there was also a way in which he had support and, and there was some safety in it for him. And especially we're talking about vulnerable and marginalized populations, you know, what, what can they do? And, and I think, but it is, that's what's so hard about this is there is an inherent risk in this humanization work. It, it seems really difficult to also ignore that. And Martin Luther King writes in Letter from a Birmingham Jail, he's being criticized by his own, it, it's so funny, you know, no matter what you do, you're critiqued, right? Martin Luther King is getting critiques from other black leaders at the time while he's in jail who are saying, your rabble rousing is disrupting our approach of, of showing the white people that we are good citizens. Mm -hmm. We don't break the law. We are not ruffians. We are we belong here because we're good. Can't you see that that's what we need to continue and your efforts, your activities are disrupting that. And Martin Luther King writes back, we have not seen in history any moment where the oppressor has voluntarily surrendered or shared power with the oppressed. The oppressed must rise up and ask for it. And, and so that was his view and, and you know, he, he has one view and we all have different stories. We all have wisdom inside of us, but it seems like that work is, is really, that, that risk in some ways is part of this humanity restoration. Um, any, anytime we question prevailing narratives, anytime we ask people to wrestle with what they believe to be true, there's, tr there's a lot of danger in that, you know, Galileo, only he didn't even have the idea it was Copernicus who had the idea that the earth revolves around the sun instead of the sun the earth being the center of the universe and Galileo really you know defended that position years later to the point where the Catholic church placed him under house arrest and declared him a heretic you know d just for taking that view and so the, the, those in power those who want the status quo to remain the same will deploy a great array of force to maintain 
the way that things are. That might be a further argument for why actually it is less risky to use friendship rather than force in order to restore the humanity, in order to make this work happen. An alternative might be an uprising, you know, alternative might be like a violent overthrow, you know, like for example. And we've learned, for example, there's a, there's a, 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 so a researcher, oh, I'm gonna forget his name, uh, Gene. He's sort of the father of, of nonviolent research. Um, and he argues that when people overthrow a tyrannical regime in order to establish democracy, they're successful in establishing a democracy only 30% of the time. But when the means of achieving that, that change in power are peaceful, the democracy endures 70% of the time. Mm. So, you, you know, the people who have power today, they have, like the US government, for example, has more military force than any group of people in the world, you know? Um, they, they, they have more power, more force, not only do they have that military force, but there's often a lot of control they have over storytelling and narratives. They have platforms to disseminate information over media. They have these people working for them. There's so much power that they hold. And so it, it could be that, that taking them on in a force versus force approach to creating change is the most risky thing that we can do. But that taking people on in a, in a, humanizing friendship based way involves risk and yet may be less risky than the alternative. Yeah, I can, you can almost um, encapsulate it as part of, you know, like Sun Tzu's art of war, where you don't attack where they're strong and you're weak. So if, yeah. we, think about, if we think about war more generally than violence, but force applied to achieve an end, right. then, then friendship can feel like, you know, I mean, it can be a tactic, which can also mean it's not genuine. Right. Um, so one, one thing I was thinking was, when you were talking just now is there's a, like a video it was like very famous on the internet maybe 10 years ago about a guy dancing in a field all mm -hmm. by himself, very outlandishly for like minutes. And then a second person joins and then the groundswell starts. And like maybe, like maybe there's, there's always gonna be people who have Matthew Stevenson's guts to go and like, all right, I'm gonna, but what, what's really needed is for the second person, is for someone else in the community to say, okay, you know what? I don't necessarily know where you're going with this. I don't necessarily uh, agree with giving this other person credibility or legitimacy of your, you know, your handshake or your presence, but I'm gonna let you, I'm gonna give you the benefit of the doubt instead of sort of piling on and now ostracizing you. Yes, I think that's right. Um, Everett Rogers wrote an incredible book called The Diffusion of Innovation. And he talks about how innovation is, is a social phenomenon. The diffusion of innovation is a social phenomenon, meaning we, we transfer ideas and technologies through relationships and through, you know, there are the early adopters and, and the biggest influence they have is over a couple of people like their friends you know, who kind of lag behind and follow. And then there's a mainstream groundswell, just like you're describing. And, you know, Atul Gawande, uh, who um, is the author of uh, books like Being Mortal and The Checklist Manifesto, um, and also the CEO of the JP Morgan Chase Amazon and uh, conglomerates um, to healthcare conglomerate, wrote this amazing piece in the New Yorker called Slow Ideas. And uh, he contrasts the spread of, of a couple of what he considers the most important medical advances of the, 20, uh, of the last 150 years. So my power went out while Teju was talking. So we arranged to finish up our conversation and you'll see or listen to that part next. So uh, this is our, our third uh, conversation. We, we had uh, time and technology, but here we, we're going we're gonna to bring it home today, I'm confident. And I want to ask you about, like, here's how I found you in the first place. I can't remember what rabbit hole I was going down, but I stumbled upon uh, an essay that you wrote on Medium about um, Maslow's hierarchy of needs or his triangle and where he got it from and how he 
sort of either misinterpreted or misrepresented the, the original teaching. And that, that really stopped me in my tracks. And it was just a beautiful, beautiful teaching. I wonder if you could kind of, like, how, how'd you get it? Like, first of all, tell us what, what you found out. Like, let's summarize it for people before we dive in. Sure. Um, so the summary is that Abraham Mazo, when he was about 30 years old, traveled to the Blackfoot uh, Reserve, to specifically the four Blackfoot tribes, to the Six Sika Reserve um, in Alberta, Canada, and spent six weeks there uh, with the Six Sika people, uh, observing how they live and spending time with them and building relationships and connection. And at the time he was interested in testing this theory about how dominance preserves social hierarchies, um, how dominance pr preserves order basically in society. There's people seeking power, they get power and they enforce kind of the rules and the, of, the, of the culture. That was a, a thought he had, he thought that might be universal. Mm -hmm. when he arrived at Siksika, the name both of the people and the place, the reserve, uh, he noticed that that was not present. It was not a culture where people were seeking dominance. Instead, it was a culture of extraordinary collaboration, um, of extraordinary egalitarianism, very little um, starvation, lots of full bellies and health and happiness. Um, and he wound up describing 80 to 90 percent of the, the Blackfoot people as what he would later call self-actualized, which is a quality that he thought only maybe five to 10 percent of Americans possessed. Mm -hmm. So just witnessing how peaceful and harmonious and collaborative this culture was and how self-actualized everyone was, he became really curious about self-actualization. Once he left uh, the Blackfoot Reserve, he started these good person notebooks, essentially documenting how good people became good people. And that, that led him to doing research that concluded in his 1943 paper, where he published the hierarchy of needs. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so essentially, in his hierarchy of needs, he describes what's called a prepotency of needs, that first we need food, shelter, water, then our attention will move toward our safety and security. Then we'll take care of community and belonging, of self-esteem, and eventually self-actualization. So it's essentially what happened is the experience he had with the Blackfoot inspired the research that he undertook to create the hierarchy of needs. Um, but, you know, he he situated his theories, you know, in research that he did predominantly from Western academic scientists and his own experiments and American culture, which is a very individualized culture. And that's in stark contrast to the Blackfoot culture, which really sees community, sees the tribe as the primary vehicle to meeting our basic needs, to uh, feel being safe and to, uh, to being fully developed uh, and expressing our purpose in the world. And they simply had different beliefs, the Blackfoot, about how we go about that. And so, um, so Maslow, uh, Maslow's journey, it seems, was heavily inspired by the Blackfoot. Mm -hmm. And, and can we, what do you mean, or what did he mean? What did he think he mean, meant by self-actualized? Because I think the, the, the definitions become important when we look at the, you know, the different ways of being, the communal versus the individualistic. So what, what did, I mean, you know, in popular culture, we, we have a sense of what that means. Mm -hmm. what, did, what did Maslow think he meant by a person who's self-actualized? Yeah, in his 1943 paper where he describes the hierarchy of needs, he, um, I can't remember the exact wording, but essentially he describes it as being the best you can be becoming the best person that you can be. When you do that, you are self-actualized. Mm. He evolved his thinking about it, I think over time, uh, later in his life, he added self-transcendence to the hierarchy of needs. Um, and he also and he said, suggested that, you know, what's, what's really important is, is to serve community and to care about other people's self-actualization. 
And, and so he began to believe that later on, but he didn't initially articulate that in his 1943 paper. But I think what he meant was being the best you can be. Okay, gotcha. So the, the, the graphic, the visual that really struck me was the Blackfeet triangle is upside down compared mm -hmm. to Maslow's. And we said was that they begin with the assumption of self-actualization, that people arrive self-actualized Right. Can you explain what, what, what that means or like, because it's, mm -hmm. it's such a different concept from the one that I grew up in. Yeah, absolutely. So a couple of thoughts here. So first of all, we all know Maslow's hierarchy is represented by a pyramid or by a triangle. Maslow himself never represented his hierarchy as a pyramid. That was something that was developed in the 1950s and 60s by um, management consultants who wanted to introduce Maslow's hierarchy to the business world. Huh. Um, and there's a, there's a complex history there. But, you know, writing this article, there are a few pieces that I got wrong. That was one of them. And I, I was prompted by readers to do more research. And that's one thing I discovered. I also discovered the Blackfoot themselves. You know, I spoke to Blackfoot scholars uh, uh, who studied Maslow as well. You know, it, it, in their case, it's not as though they have a model they're organizing their society around, you know, but this is an approximation in some ways. Uh, it shouldn't be, you know, the, the diagram in that blog post shouldn't be taken as a perfect illustration of, you know, the very specific framework that all black, all Blackfoot people use to organize their right. lives. Like they go up and they worship the triangle and it's got some. No, no, yeah, nothing like that. Nothing like that. And so, um, so it's, you know, originally I, made the argument in that paper, and I'm publishing a revision that, that gets this really clear, I made the argument that Maslow may have appropriated and flipped upside down the Blackfoot model or pyramid. And what I've come to discover is while a lot of the principles are held within Blackfoot culture, there isn't something so clean and pristine like a Blackfoot model that Maslow was able to flip upside down. But according to many folks who were at Siksika, you know, there were a number of things he didn't understand or capture. So one of them might have been this idea that self-actualization is something to be engineered, something to, to make happen. And for the Blackfoot, they, they raise their children, for example, with a high degree of permissiveness. Um, they kind of encourage them to do certain things, but when they didn't do those things, you know, the children have their own will, they sort of let it go and, and, and knew they couldn't force or control their children. They also gave children opportunities to vote and participate in decision making at the tribe level. And, and so in many ways, even children were considered like these equal members of society. And I think part of the reason is that all of us come into the world in the Blackfoot worldview, um, you know, with the spark of divinity in us. And, and it's the work of the tribe to steward this being, the sacredly imbued being, by caring for that being, keeping that being safe, educating that being, so they're able to express that sacred purpose in the world somehow. And, and another, a way that I heard Ryan Heavyhead, who's a Blackfoot scholar that I spoke to describe it is, in the Western model, you go to college, you pay your tuition, you study your classes, you take your tests, and at the end of that process, you earn your degree. In the Blackfoot model, you're credentialed from the very beginning. You have your degree, at the very beginning, um, but you spend your life living up to that trust and that respect that you are given for holding that credential and that degree at the very beginning. And so it's not as though the Blackfoot don't have uh, rites of passage or education or apprenticeship through which, through which you know, younger people are handed down wisdom from older people. Obviously that's happening, um, but it is a presumption of greatness and the, the rather than a, an engineering of greatness that marks I think a difference between the Blackfoot view and the and the Maslow view. Mm -hmm. And why is this so important for your work? Like what's what, you spent a ton of time first of all writing it and then so graciously hearing people saying no you got parts of it wrong and you went back and rewrote it. Like what's who cares? Like, what, why is this? Why is Maslow versus the Blackfeet models, triangles? Why is this important to us? What are, what are the what are the hidden assumptions that we need to be aware of if we want to you know, create a, a world in which people can thrive? 
Yeah, and there's a lot to say here. I think that one reason that this seems important to me is in American culture, we tell a story that says, take care of yourself. Let each person take care of themselves. Let each person pull themselves up by their bootstraps. Let each person work hard and create the life that is possible for every single one of us. That's the American dream. Mm -hmm. and, and what that story makes invisible is the myriad beings who participate in any of our well being. When we are born, how do we get fed? How are we kept warm? How do we learn to walk and to talk and to read only through the grace of other human beings, be they our parents or our grandparents or people who adopt us or um, all of us are only able to grow because other people generously, hopefully lovingly offer us what we need to flourish. And at some point, what we, what we tell the story of in America is, is that to be an adult means not to need that. To be an adult means, okay, we do that for children, you know, but for adults, we stop. Adults take care of themselves. And is it actually true? You know, is it actually true that that's the case? Um, because all of us depend on roads built by other people, houses, often built by other people, the internet built by other people, devices, words, all of these things created by other beings. All of us depend on, on the whole world in order to flourish and to thrive. Everything in our life requires other beings to play their part, the oxygen that we breathe, the ground on which we walk. So there's an illusion in this concept of self-sufficiency and that each of us should take care of ourselves. Maybe we earn the money to pay other people to take care of us, but still on the other side of that money is a whole world that's working in some way to care for us. So money is this means that we use to actually invite interdependence, invite people to care for us. Mm -hmm. The problem is that our society is one in which currently one in four people are food insecure. It's one in which the top 0.1% of Americans own as much wealth as the bottom 90% of Americans. It's a culture where one, uh, four in 10 Americans could not afford a $400 emergency before the pandemic. That number is probably even higher now. We have extraordinary inequality in this supposedly meritocracy free type of place that we are building. And what we're not acknowledging is, in fact, that we have created a communal system that privileges certain people, that includes certain people and says, these are the people who will be taken care of by the system. You know, when they fall, you know, we will catch them. But everybody else, it's up to them to care for themselves. And so this narrative is an insidious way, I believe, of, of saying only some people belong, only a small number of people belong and will be held by the community web, by the, the in our culture. And, and that's, you know, those are the wealthiest people in our society, for example, those with tremendous privilege, those who happen to be white, those who happen to be male. Um, and many of them work very hard. Many of them face great struggles. Um, and so just, Having those identities is in no way a guarantee of anything in our culture, but predominantly our system is designed to support those, those individuals. And only over time have we made adjustments to increase and grow the number of people who are included in that web of community support. For the Blackfoot, every member of the tribe is included. Everyone is held by that communal web. And to be an adult, does not mean to depart from that web. It means now you are able to contribute to that web. And so our work at Gather4 is about building the neighborhood safety net. It's the idea that the Blackfoot have scaled the concept of family 
to include everyone. You don't let something happen to your family in a healthy family. You don't let your father suffer alone. You don't let your mother pay her bills on her own if you can help it, if you have a healthy relationship. You don't, that doesn't happen with your sibling, et cetera, right? And, and, and so they have scaled that concept to make sure that each member of their society is going to be okay. And in, in America, maybe we're moving in that direction right now in the rise of mutual aid groups and are more seriously considering reparations for, for descendants of, of former slaves and for Native Americans in, in, the, um, in the consideration of universal basic income. We're starting to include more and more people, but we are still leaving so many people on the margins to fend for themselves who are outside of this core group that can care for their basic needs. And so the answer to your question very simply, Howie, is that our civilizational story, if you ask me, is not working. And I think the Blackfoot tell a story that should we try on, we may in fact be able to create a civilization where everyone can flourish. And that's why I think this is important. Mm. It's almost like um, since, since we last talked, there was a, a, a thread on my next door where somebody was asking about a guy who sits at the intersection of 15501 and Man's Chapel Road and begs. And he, and he has a sign that says, you know, disabled vet. And, and the, the, the thread, it's now made 300 comments. You know, it's basically people saying, it's so easy to get a job now. They're just being lazy. The government is not helping with all the handouts. I don't trust them. What if they buy liquor? And, the, and then there's the other half saying, it's none of my business. You don't understand what people are going through. But like if we look at, you know, if, if the Blackfoot scholars look at a civilization like ours, they would say there is something broken systemically. When our civilization looks at places where there's great poverty, we blame the people in poverty, right? They're, they don't have, <clears throat> whether it's, you know, it used to be genetic, right? Races were inferior. Now it's cultural. Well, they didn't get the education. They didn't get the upbringing. Um, and of course, the, you know, the, the nice thing about that is that it makes everyone who is succeeding feel good about themselves. And the dangerous thing about that is that there's, you know, it's not prescriptive. There's nothing you can do about it. And we have plenty of, of historical antecedents of extremely unequal civilizations just destroying themselves. That's right. I think that's right. I think being able to tell that story that this person has failed is a way to say, well, in that case, I need not do anything. I need not take any action. I need not participate in this person's flourishing. But let's say it's not their fault. Let's say they are the victim of systemic discrimination and that our system has treated them unfairly. Then, then what? Can we tolerate that? Can we accept that? And so it, it's, it's not to say, I mean, I have a, a view but let's say we can't prove one is true over the other, you know, let's say we don't know, you know, um, it just, it just seems that there are, it, it is hard to find peace in our own hearts when we are confronted with other people who are going through tremendous suffering. You know, Martin Luther King talks about this. He says, we are all connected in an interwoven web. What affects one affects another. It's really difficult to see another pure person suffer and not suffer ourselves unless we in some way dehumanize them and we dehumanize ourselves. Mm. Unless, we, unless we create a barrier to our own heart, our own feeling, our own, our own natural compulsion to empathize and to, to offer compassion. And so I think that we all, we all suffer when we ignore the suffering of others, you know, regardless of what is true. And, and in my study, in my inquiry into history, in how different cultures have practiced, I do believe that our culture has structurally designed for the exclusion of some people. And that is the main reason that they suffer. In other words, poverty is not the result of scarcity. Poverty is the result of inequality. Poverty is the result of a choice to exclude, to say some people don't belong. And, and when we do that, again, you know, we, I think 
dehumanize ourselves and that that we we it's hard to find happiness witnessing others suffer mm. let's let's end there but on a slightly upbeat note tell us where people can find you can can find gather for and can start to you know take action to include yeah, um, people can find out about Gather4 at gather4.org. We are doing a fundraiser at the end of June. We'll be trying to raise $80,000 to provide direct cash assistance to folks who have lost their jobs and are facing food and housing insecurity during this pandemic. So if people wanna learn about that fundraiser, meet some of the neighbors that we're working with, um, we'll ho be hosting an event uh, where that can happen. Um, you can find out more on our website, gather4.org. Um, and also email me any questions at teju, T-E-J-U, at gather4.org. Awesome. Thank you so much. I've, uh, you know, this, this conversation has been such a wonderful balancing of the work that I've been doing internally with uh, our, our mutual uh, hero, Tyson Yonkaporta, and, and his work. And it's, um, I'm also hearing a lot of echoes from um, the vegan part of my soul and my audience around, you know, de-animalizing or dehumanizing, um, you know, in, ter in terms of being, a being willing to ignore suffering and cruelty at any level. Um, and I just, um, you know, I'm, I'm so inspired by your spirit and the the combination of humility and fierceness that I feel is just, uh, I'm, so, <laughs> I'm so happy to have had this opportunity to get to know you and to and hopefully share, share you and your message and your mission um, with, with my folks. Thank you so much, Howie. Such a gift to have had this time with you. Uh, enjoy, have a great weekend. And I hope to talk to you again soon. That sounds good. I look forward to it, Howie. Take good uh, care. All right. I hope you enjoyed that conversation. I hope you were as inspired as I am uh, to see such beautiful work being done in the world by such a focused, beautiful soul. So you can check out the show notes for today's episode at plantyourself.com slash 467. Uh, also, be sure to check out gather4.org. And if you do a, a search, you'll find Teju's uh, TED Talk from a couple of years ago. Um, you will not find too many Teju Ravi Lochans uh, on Google. He'll, the one you find is probably him. And it was a TEDx talk. Um, it's got a great story. It's very entertaining as well as being inspiring. So garden news. I got out there this morning um, before the fire ants got to me and uh, weeded two thirds of a bed. We have to go pick up uh, sweet potato slips from down at Chatham uh, Home and Country, whatever it's called, Farm and Home. Uh, later today, put those in the ground. We also have a bunch of tomatoes to go in. Um, and what else with the garden? The blueberries are not quite ripe, but I saw a cardinal today looking very suspicious, hanging around near one of the bushes. So we have to go hang our, our uh, Teflon reflective tape to uh, scare them off a little bit so we get some of that harvest. In movement news, big weekend for me. I uh, played in a local uh, Ultimate Frisbee tournament in Chapel Hill, and I played in six games in two days, and my feet were killing me, but my knee was not, and I, my um, Morton's Neuroma wasn't bothering me. So I want to give a big shout out to Monkey Bar Jim and John and Jesse Hines for the way they have helped me rehab. So I feel like I'm, I'm coming back. And it looks like running on pavement, on concrete, on asphalt is not good for me, but grass and trails seem to be fine. So I'm really, really happy about that and going to continue rehabbing and starting to build up my speed for nationals in Aurora, Colorado in the middle of July. Uh, 